What's up? I'm just here chilling in my bed. Relaxing. Um, after eating some Subway. Um, I want to go over a Christmas story that I'm sure a lot of people have heard about. But not in a way that is yet been projected for you. So we're just going to run through this. And um, I really hope you enjoy it. Come on, you got to get out of here. Come on. Well, what came down? What came down? The, we crashed. The other trade center's down. It's down. It's down. Some very, very sketchy details reaching us here at Sky Centre. Important enough to bring to you, though, at this early stage, we believe that a plane has crashed into the World Trade Centre in New York. Right now we're getting information, Al, that it was a small commuter plane, and, of course, we'll let people know as soon as we have more information as to what actually caused this, and, of course, on everybody's mind, who was yeah. might have been hurt. just seen is, is about the most shocking videotape I've ever seen. What are the odds of two separate okay. planes hitting both towers? It is completely impossible to understand why this is happening and to figure out what in the world is going on. We heard a big bang and then we saw smoke coming out and everybody started running out and we saw the plane on the other side of the building and there was smoke everywhere and people are jumping out the windows. Over there they're jumping out the windows I guess because they're trying to save themselves. I don't know. Blew up a big explosion, people started running, it was just chaos everywhere. People jumping out, people just kept jumping and jumping and jumping. And, and now you, you have to move from talk about a possible accident to talk about something deliberate. Let's go to President Bush right now. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. I have spoken to the Vice President, to the Governor of New York, to the Director of the FBI, and I've ordered that the full resources of the federal government go to help the victims and their families and, the, and to conduct a full-scale investigation to hunt down and to find those folks who committed this act. Terrorism against our nation will not stand. And now if you join me in a moment of silence. We described to you the possibility of that North Tower collapsing. About five minutes after we went off the air, it did collapse. Once again, we have no idea at this point the loss of life. I can only tell you there were hundreds of emergency workers down there, about five or six blocks. In the first few minutes, emergency workers were trying just basically to get out of there, to survive. You could see that written in their faces. The situation was so desperate, they just wanted to get out of there. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices. 
secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. Just want to go over a huge warning the Lord has written in His um, Word for us. Um, in the book of Peter, 2 Peter. Okay, we're going to start here in uh, 2, 2 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise governments presumptuous are they self-willed they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities government dominion to think against to disesteem to despise what the Lord has set up to despise before the Lord now again we bring what is good and what is bad to be together in Christ, knowing that which is good and evil, having also the tree of life present in us as we have tasted of its fruit. We now know as we dwell in the kingdom of God what is best for eternity. Therefore, there will be no more falling, there will be no more being cast out of heaven, we will all dwell in the holy land that has been created from the very beginning for us to dwell in, knowing as gods, as it establishes in Genesis, knowing as gods, good and evil, but not disobeying the commandments. Because we will know again what is best and good for all. And here we're going to go over um, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he has his kingdom restored to him because he um, finally honored that which God had set up. God had set up his government, he had put him as the king. He was not regarding that in the Lord's way. He was not regarding himself under the Lord's authority. So his kingdom was taken from him and he was cast out of his kingdom to be as a beast seven times over is what these previous verses here are explaining because he didn't acknowledge the Lord as Lord. So we can read here in Daniel 4.34 At the end of the days I Nebuchadnezzar lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and my understanding returned unto me and my understanding returned unto me 
And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Okay? So then he got his kingdom back. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What dost thou? At the same time my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my lords sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom. And excellency and majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and honor the King of Heaven. All whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride is he able to abase. A lot of pressure to design a building that was special, but there was also a lot of pressure to make sure that it was the best practices brought to bear. One World Trade Center faced a Janus task. It had to stand tall without displaying any hubris. Almost impossible for a building that's the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere. Designing a building is, is never an easy task. Designing a super tall building is even harder. And now here we're faced with the challenge of designing a super tall building in New York City with the world watching us. They began to look at why were these structures so vulnerable? What can we do better in the future? We knew that the current codes will not be sufficient. So we had to basically design a building to satisfy a future code that hasn't been written yet. So we had to collect a lot of the reports that were available at that time and basically use our judgment. You don't want to make new rules that would be too conservative and basically cause dramatic increase in costs. I mean, it all has to be reasonable, but obviously address the issue. I think the confidence we had in each other was it allowed us to come up with the right choice well ahead of the code being changed. And now we find that code is actually matching our ideas. We always thought this building should be about simplicity and geometry. Clean, strong, monumental as possible. You see here how the two are now one from like let's say one division and another division that were hostile towards each other. They were brought down towards each other and how they became one together and freedom, the one world freedom tower. All right, we're going to go through this. This explains how um, when in um, Genesis 3, when Eve and um, Satan were called out by God and told that there would be enmity, which is like a hostility between um, the seed of the serpent and her own seed. This verse here explains the bringing of what is good and what is bad in one in Christ, who is God, God's completed finished work for eternity and salvation. Bringing good and bad together, knowing both good and evil, yet having the tree of life introduced now into us. Therefore, continuing to do always what is best, for all creation. Thanks be to the Savior, our Lord, 
our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll start here at 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and who hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity or hostility, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So here, twain just means, he says, for to make in himself, in himself, all that he is, out of the two that we had become, knowing good and evil, and being cast out of the Garden of Eden, right? That's what our ancestors had to do. They had to be cast out, and then they had to... Um, Basically, you know, Israelites had to get delivered out of um, um, captivation, which was the um, enmity between, you know, the, the seeds, the, the right and wrong. It was um, a battle of good and evil, and it was being manifest over the world um, through what we were. We were projecting this out into the world creating war and devastation and chaos. But Christ here is saying that he's bringing the two into one, into his completed work, so that we know what is good for the kingdom of God to last and be sustained. This is also why the Bible goes on and explains about trials and um, temptations and stuff like that. All these things are to bring you to the understanding that all this evil stuff that is going on to the Christian is to bring enlightenment to know what is good and bad so that we can live forever knowing that which is bad we don't ever want this to happen again, you know we don't want to we don't want to see all the blood in the streets and the wars going on bombs being dropped airplanes flying into towers all this other stuff We'd much rather live in joy and peace and be content and happy with each other, knowing all truth, the completed work, which is truth, to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace eternally, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the hostility thereby, the war manifests. He slain it by his completed work. This is what he came to do, was to preach his message, that he was the Son of God, and that you can believe in his completed work already, bringing good and bad together. Therefore, after death, you go to judgment under judgment to yourself, <clears throat> saying to the good you and the bad you, well, I already knew work was completed in Christ, so that I can know good and bad, and forever dwell in the kingdom of heaven, always continuing to do what is best for this kingdom. Right? I mean, it's complete simplicity in Christ. Okay? So that's that. All right, now I want to just go over something that I came across that I thought was really interesting. I've heard about this um, being said more than a few times um, when Jesus Christ was born. And I thought I'd um, 
just put together a video about um, an American Christmas story and how it reminds me that Jesus is our Savior, bringing what is absolutely awful and absolutely beautiful together in one and absolutely good so we can know for eternity what is best for the kingdom of God that we are in and going to be into after we pass into judgment so here's this When considering the birth date of Jesus, it is easy to eliminate any posted date that does not occur in the fall of the year. Although some have speculated that Jesus was born in the springtime, even during Passover, a birth date in the spring is not reasonable, due principally to the biblical method of calculating the month of Jesus' birth. The biblical method of calculating the birth of Jesus involves figuring the birth date of John the Baptist and then applying other information in Luke's Gospel regarding the time difference between their births. This is clearly, this clearly places Jesus' birthday in the fall of the year. The Gospel of Luke covers the birth of John the Baptist before giving details of the birth of Jesus. There's a reason for this. The two are inseparably linked in, chrono in chronology of their births as well as in their ministries. For John came to prepare the way. Determining the birth date of John the Baptist is the first puzzle piece in our process of assembling the puzzle of Jesus' birth. <clears throat> Luke provides clues related to John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, the priest, which help us unlock the date for the birth of Jesus. This requires some biblical sleuthing to, divide, to divert the months and days of the year of the births of John and Jesus. Some important information from the Old Testament and from the Jewish Manasseh, Misha, are also needed to calculate John's birthday, the initial step in figuring Jesus' birthday. In Luke, we read, in the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of, of, of Abaji, Abja, Abja. This is in Luke 1 5 NIV. This is an important clue as to the priestly division of Abja was the eighth as the priestly division of Abja was the eighth of 24 divisions which King David on God's instruction had set up to service the temple reference to 1st Chronicles 24 1 through 19 28 12 through 13 King David had divided the descendants of the sons of Eleazar and Ethmer, the two sons of Aaron, into 24 groups, courses, and set up a schedule for the priests, Kon Hamin, to service the temple in an ordinary manner throughout the year. Each course served for one week, Second Chronicles 23, 8, and 1 Chronicles 9.25.
from Sabbath to Sabbath, twice a year. In addition, according to Jewish Misna, all courses served together during the three pilgrim feasts, Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Each course, therefore, served for a total of five weeks during a normal year. So you can see here how this is um, biblically correct in um, chronological Colizing the the specific dates that are needed to um, identify um, a correct dis dispensation in earthly times. A normal year on the present Hebrew calendar consists of twelve lunar months of 29 or 30 days for a total of 354 days which is about 11 days fewer than a solar system reference 365.24 days during a regular Jewish year which occurs 12 times in a 19 year cycle a total of 51 weeks would, would we require temple coverage, 24 courses, times 2 per year, plus 3 weeks of pilgrim feasts. P pilgrim feasts weeks equals 51 weeks coverage. Calculated dates for the births of John the Baptist and Jesus. In 4 BC, Jesus' birth is assumed to be in 3 BC from other historical evidence as well as astronomical evidence to be presented in future posts. Nisan 1 was the equivalent of our March 29th, and the preceding Sabbath was March 24th making the week of the duties of the first priestly course from the Sabbath noon, March 24th, to Sabbath noon, March 31st, and the second course from March 31st to April 7th, etc. The third course, which started on our April 7th, was interpreted by the Passover Unleavened Bread week-long celebration, when all the priests officiated together, and this caused the third course to extend its services to extend its service until the Sabbath after Passover, which was April first in four BC. <laughs> the period of service for the eighth course of Abja, to which Zechariah belonged, was from May nineteenth to May 26. It was most likely this late spring administration when Zechariah's service was interrupted by the angel's appearance, announcing his wife's imminent pregnancy because of his unbelief. He was struck dumb during his service in the temple, which immediately disqualified him from his priestly duties. Leviticus 21, 16 through 23. Therefore he left home sometime between May 26 and June 1st. Elizabeth would have conceived. She later gave birth to John the Baptist, Baptist near March 10 in 3 BC. After the gestation period of nine months and ten days, a total of 28 days. This would place the birth of Jesus six months later. Luke 1 26 through 38 in the first half of September. Okay. Of course, other possibility is that the date that the angel 
struck Zechariah and caused him to lose speech was during Zechariah's second service term in the second half of the year, rather than during the first term of service in the spring. However, this is unlikely as it would have caused the birth of John the Baptist to be near mid-September. Consequently, Jesus' birth would have been in March, during the rainy season. William Ramsey demonstrates in his book, Born in Bethlehem, that the general time of year for the start of the census was from August to October, to encourage higher participation, and not during the rainy season in mid-March. We therefore know that Jesus was most probably not born in the spring, since we know that Joseph was taking his family to Bethlehem for the census, at which time Jesus was born. And then, and we then conclude that Zachariah's service in the temple when he was struck dumb was during the first half of the year, rather than during the second half. From this method of calculating the birth date of Jesus, from information related to the birth date of John the Baptist in Luke's Gospel, as well as from information on the timing of the Roman census, we see that Jesus was most likely born in the fall of the year, probably in September. It is admittedly impossible to arrive at a specific date for the birth of either John the Baptist or Jesus based on priestly courses and the information in Luke's Gospel, but it helps to approximate a likely range of dates. Tarish 1, Yom Turah, the Feast of Trumpets, began at sundown on September 11, 3 BC, when the day changed from Yule 30 to Tishri 1. In my next post, I will present both astronomical zodiac evidence and a scriptural reference from Revelation 12, 1-6 to prove that Jesus was born on September 11th in 3 BC. When the astronomical signs in Revelations aligned precisely and uniquely with this specific date established the birth date of Jesus from the birth date of John the Baptist in doing so by use of precise astronomical evidence, therefore appear to be in agreement. All this is building a case for the correct date of the birth of Jesus. And he goes on to explain in his next post, he will discuss the evidence for Jesus' birth as supported by specific astronomical references in scripture. And there are indeed astronomical references in scripture. I, for one, do believe that Jesus was born around September because I have went forth through the Bible while I was incarcerated in Muscatine County Jail to figure it all out as well. And I did indeed have to go through John the Baptist and many other things with only a Bible. And I did not have a computer. So I came to around sometime around it's kind of, you can't figure it out really unless you go i guess he says something about astronomical signs go into some kind of astronomical signs as well in revelation um and that was years ago that was back in my 20s i'm 35 now so i just wanted to get this all out there because i think it's amazing and i think it's also really important that we um, stop despising the government because God has set it up for the purpose that it is going to bring forth. So um, repent of that because it is, um, don't get me wrong, I don't vote because I understand that um, we are in a theocracy. Christianity, Christians are in a theocracy and God reveals to us what is to be done and sometimes he doesn't even reveal it. He just says, do it, and we don't hear it, and we do it anyway. Because that's that's what it's all doing. That's all we're doing. Um, but, 
Yeah. God bless.